ahead and take your Bibles and go to the book of Matthew this morning. Matthew chapter 7. I hope this message will be a help. Uh, kind of what has inspired this message and what I want to talk about today. Um, you know, we do a lot of soul winning out here. We, we go around, we try to tell people how they can go to heaven. And we ask the question uh, quite a bit to people. We ask them, you know, if you died today, do you know for sure where you'd spend eternity? And most of the time, you know, we get answers. People saying, well, you know, I'm not real sure. Uh, where I would spend eternity, we'll ask them, you know, if, you know, if you know the Lord is your Savior and, you know, or how do you know? And they'll say, well, they'll start talking about a lot of different things and it's usually not the things that they should be talking about. They'll, they'll start talking about their works and a lot of other things. And it is very clear to me that, you know, once again, the Bible turns out to be true, but most people, they don't know the way to heaven. Most people are going the wrong way. And I'm, I titled this message this morning, Directions to Heaven from Rock Falls. Okay? Now, I, would, I believe that this message would apply probably just about anywhere. But Rock Falls, Sterling, that's where, we do most, that's where I do most of my soul winning. And the things I want to cover in here, this is the things I am hearing all the time in this town. And I want to, I want to address these things because it's so important. That we, that we get these things right. And so let's go ahead and read Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. It says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So right there, the Bible makes it very clear. Most people are taking the broad road. They're going the wrong way. But those who are getting to heaven, those who are doing it, they're going that straight and narrow way. And the Bible says, few there be that find it. Verse 15 says, beware of false prophets which come, un come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Wherefore, by our, um, verse 19, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits, ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Listen, it is very important. We take these words of Jesus Christ here very literal because these things are true, and I believe they have proven to be true in our own community, uh, going out, trying to tell people how to get to heaven. It is very clear that most people are taking that broad way. And, and so, you know, the, real clear, and I think most of y'all know this, but I think it's definitely worth repeating just in case someone here doesn't. But we see that the way to heaven it is. It's a narrow way. It's not what most people are doing. In fact, it's not, not just what most of the world's doing, but it's not even what most of Christianity is doing. We're gonna, I'm going to show you that even what a lot of places that call themselves churches and uh, claim Christianity, their way of salvation is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says, few there be that find it. It's, and so we, uh, it's very important we understand that. We take that literal. We see that the only way to heaven the only way it says narrow is the way. Well, what is that way specifically? Well, in John chapter 14, verse number four, Jesus got about as specific as you could. He's there. He's talking with his disciples. You have Thomas. He's kind of the doubter. He's the skeptic. And it says in verse four, whither I go, ye know, and the way, ye know, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way Jesus saith unto him? I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's a lot of people today that are trying to get to God. They're trying to get to the Father. But the Bible makes it very, very clear. The only way to the Father is through Jesus Christ. You're going to have to get there through His work. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. That's offensive. I say this all the time. When, I, when you say Jesus is the only way to heaven, you've just offended most of the world. 
But understand, it doesn't change the truth that Jesus is the only way to heaven. There's only one road to heaven. It's a narrow way. It's Jesus Christ. We take that road we, by faith. Ephesians chapter 2, 8, and 9, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's by grace through faith. You don't deserve it. If you're on your way to heaven today, it's not because you're good. You don't deserve it. You cannot possibly deserve it. There's nothing you can do to deserve it. You just have to believe God's word when he says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. When he said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, what do we do? We pray, we call on him, we ask him for that gift, and we believe that he's going to give it to us when we ask. And our faith is counted for righteousness. When we believe him, when we trust his work and not our own works, and we see not, you know, is it, is it through Jesus Christ only? It's by grace through faith. But the Bible, I mean, flat out multiple times spells it out that it is without works. Okay. It's, it's not that it's just not of works. Okay. Some people always want to try to find some way to include works in there. Surely I have to do something. But Galatians chapter two and verse 16 says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Listen, when it comes to the law of God, we're all going to fall short. We have already fallen short. We cannot be justified by the works of the law. And for you to have the idea to think that, you know what, I can do something good enough where I will earn heaven, it shows that you don't understand the law. You don't understand just how holy God is. You don't understand that we have fallen short of the glory of God. We've come short of the glory of God. And if we're going to get to heaven, it's going to be by his mercy. It's going to be by grace, unmerited favor. You're going to have to, by faith, accept the free gift. And if you're trying to work for it, then folks, you haven't accepted a free gift. If you've got to work for it, if you have to pay for it, it's not a free gift. And the Bible makes it very clear that it is a free gift, something that God gives freely. And the only qualification he put on there is it's for those who believe. That's, that's it. And the Bible teach, makes it very clear too, you know, to him that worketh not, but believeth. His faith is counted unto him for righteousness. Believing is, is not a work. We can't earn it. We can't work for it. We can only accept it by faith. And that, that, that's it. But the vast majority, they always have, and they always will be wrong when it comes to these things. It says in verse 13 of Matthew 7, you know, um, or when it talks about the, talking about the broad way, it says many there be which go in there at. People, they'll sometimes they use a majority. The news media does that. I saw a thing on the news years ago where they were talking about how many pastors now are saying that there is no such thing as hell. And I thought, you know what? It doesn't really matter. Even if it's a majority that are saying that, it doesn't change the fact that it's, there is a hell. The Bible makes it very clear that there is a hell. It doesn't matter that a vast majority of the world believes that you have to do something to earn it, that you have to work for it in some way. The Bible very clearly says, no, you don't work for it. You can't work for it. You can't earn it. And it just so happens that, you know, the fact that the majority of the world thinks that way, it ought to be a strong reminder to us that, you know what, we probably are right, because the Bible says few there be that find it. And so we can't, we can't go off things like that. The majority, they always have and they always will be wrong. There will be many false prophets that try to lead you astray. Now, listen, you know, I get myself in trouble sometimes pointing out false prophets, and I know we're never supposed to you know, bash any other preacher. And I don't, I don't want to personally go after anybody, but listen, if somebody's preaching a false gospel, they are a false prophet. If I don't care how nice they look, I, they might wear the nicest suit and tie. They might have the biggest smile. They might have the warmest, friendliest handshake that you have ever felt in your life. But listen, if they are preaching another gospel, if they are preaching a works-based salvation, they are a false prophet. They are a wolf in sheep's clothing. Okay, that sheep's clothing, okay? We do, whenever it comes to who we like, who we think is legit, we often look at the outward, don't we? I mean, look at how nice his family looks. You know, look at how you know, nice of a smile he has. Surely, 
this person is a good person. How could you, you know, take somebody that's that nice looking? You know, you get one of these, you know, just old, nice, friendly, you know, white-haired preachers that I mean just has that, you know, voice of a grandfather that you I mean you just can't help but love that guy. And then, but listen, if he's preaching a salvation that adds works, he's a false prophet. I don't care how much you like him. Listen, there's a lot of false prophets out there that I think are very likable. If it wasn't for the fact that they're false prophets. But they are. They've got great personalities. They're very good speakers. They're very talented people. But listen, Bible said they're going to be false prophets that are going to try to lead you astray. It's mentioned in 15. He said, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. In verse 22, he says, many... Okay, this isn't a few. He says, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Y'all, there's going to be a lot of guys who have accomplished a lot of great things that claimed to be preachers of righteousness, but listen, they weren't. Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. So how do we know? The Bible says, by your fruits. Ye shall know them. You have to check the fruit. And listen, most of the time when we're checking fruit, we're looking at the outward things. And when it comes to actions, yes, we want to look at those things. But you all understand that, you know, sometimes it takes a long time. It can take years before these people get exposed. A lot of the guys that have been out there preaching false gospels that have turned out to be bad people. Okay, it was years before people figured it out. But the thing is, though, that's not the main thing we look at. The main thing we should look at is what are they saying? What are they preaching? What's coming out of their mouths? It says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of God. What we need to look at is, hey, does this guy's preaching line up with the Bible? And if it doesn't line up with the Bible, you shouldn't listen to it, folks. Listen, I I want people to think I'm credible and listen to what I have to say. But folks, check up with the Bible. Make sure it lines up. I could be a false prophet. Okay. Uh, Are you? Well, if I'm a false prophet, I'm going to tell you no. Okay. (laughs) But at, at the same time, there is a way you can find out you check the scriptures. Okay. You can't just ask me if I'm a false prophet. You can't just look at how I'm dressed or how I act. You, that's, that's not enough, okay? Is what I'm preaching, does it line up with the Scripture? And we have to, we have to do that. We're let, many preachers are getting away with murder, spiritual murder, when it comes to what they are preaching, and we shouldn't stand for that. That is, that is not okay. And it is very clear, the way to hell, it is a broad, it's a broad way. It's a broad path. And the way I like to explain it too, because I personally believe, you know, there's, There's one path to heaven. It's a narrow way. It's through Jesus Christ. But then there's this broad path that if you're not on the narrow path, you're on the broad path. But listen, there's a lot of different religions out there. There's a lot of different things people are trying, but y'all understand they all lead to the exact same place, don't they? And so the way I kind of want to explain this to you is, you know, the way to hell is a broad way, but I believe on that broad path, there's many different lanes that you can take. Okay? And what lane people are on it really doesn't matter because they all lead to the same place but i want to i want to show you some of these lanes that i see people in our town in when i when i talk to people it's like you know if they're not saved they're on the broad path but it's just a matter of kind of figuring out which lane they're in sometimes and i want to show you how these are in fact all heading to the same place and so the first lane i'm seeing people take it's the religious lane First, look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. The religious lane. Most people today, many people today, our area, when you go out door knocking here, one of the biggest challenges we face is the fact that most people 
are religious. They, they claim some kind of religion. Therefore, they think they're covered. Okay? And unless I want to go and just absolutely bash that religion, which is just going to be offensive, you know, it, it's, it's hard to show these people that they're not really saved. They think they're covered because, you know, I'm Catholic, I'm Methodist, or even I'm Baptist. They think they're covered because of those things. They're taking the religious route. You know, they got dunked in a tank, they got sprinkled, they took communion, they did a confirmation. They think they're covered because of their religion, but what they don't realize they're doing is something the Bible makes very clear we're not supposed to do. But the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. You know what people are doing when they're using the religious lane? is they are depending on men. You understand, you know, religions, they're set up by men. They're often run by men. Many people, they go to men to confess their sins. They go to men to be absolved from their sins. You know, and understand too, I believe in the church. I believe in the local church. Uh, I believe in the structure of the local church. But you all understand, you could come to this church and do everything that we tell you to do. But if you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation, you're not saved. You, you could come here and you can make us think you're saved. You could get baptized. We can make you a member and we can make you a trustee or a deacon in this church. But listen, that won't get you to heaven. Your name being on a membership role of Liberty Baptist Church will not guarantee you a place into heaven. You have to go through Jesus Christ. There's one mediator. We are not a mediator between God and man. We are assembly of people. We come together. We try to encourage each other, uh, you know, lift, exhort one another. We try to, you know, proclaim the scriptures, you know, teaching one another. We do all those things. But listen, this church, it's not a mediator between you and God. Jesus Christ is the only mediator. There's only one. It's Jesus Christ. And you know what? Well, I like, ba well, I like being a Baptist and I have no intentions of ever changing from being Baptist. Do you understand though that it, that when it comes to all the different religions, it, it really doesn't matter as long as you've gone through Jesus Christ. As long as you put your faith and trust in Him, you will get to heaven. And now I think you'll learn the scriptures better here. I think you're gonna, uh, you'll learn how to live a better, happier, more effective, spiritually productive life from the teaching that you get here. But listen, the way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And it is not about a religion. And so many people, yeah, I'm, I'm this. Or especially, too, I've talked to people that they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm Baptist, too. Ah, great. So how do you know you're going on your way to heaven? And then they'll start talking about being Baptist. Well, listen, I love being Baptist. I wish I could get everybody in town to be Baptist. But that being Baptist won't get you to heaven. You've got to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So the religious lane, it's just going to lead you to hell. The, uh, turn over to Romans chapter 3, verse 10. This is a huge thing that we get all the time. You ask people, how do you know you're on your way to heaven? Well, I think I'm a pretty good person. I've never killed anybody. I've never stolen anything. I've never been to jail. I've never done this. I've never done that. You know, I take care of people. You know, I, I give to the poor. You know, I gave a bum on the street $5 the other day, and I just know that the Lord smiled on that. I'm surely going to get into heaven by those things. But Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Listen, it's easy in this wicked world to look at yourself and think I'm not too bad. It's easy if you want to come into this church where I believe the people in this church are saved. They're on their way to heaven. But listen, it's because they put their faith and trust in Christ, not because of how good they are. And you could come into this church, all right? I'm not trying to insult everybody here that's from our church, but if you're a visitor today, if you want to come here and try to measure yourself up against the people in this church, it probably wouldn't be real hard to feel good about yourself. Not down on our people, but it's just, you know, hey, we're people. We're not that great. It's not real tough competition, is it? All right, it's not that tough a competition. But do you understand... That if that is your attitude, you don't understand. You don't understand the holiness of God. You don't understand his righteousness and his holiness. And understand that you know, nothing as sinful and as wicked as we are can be in his presence. And if we're going to be able to ever be in the presence of a holy God, 
Something has to take care of our sin. Something has to cleanse us of our sin. And the Bible makes it very clear that the blood of Christ is the only thing that will cleanse us from our sins. And so once again, that good person lane, if you're just trying to be good, thinking that will get me to heaven, do you all understand you're going to end up in the same hell that the Satanist ends up in? If you, do, you can be the best person in town, the newspaper could do stories about you, the news could come out and do a story about all the good things you've done. But listen, if you've never put your faith and trust in Christ, you will go to the same hell that the murderer goes to. Because being a good person, it, 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 leads, it leads to hell. It's just another lane on the same broad way. Another path people take. Turn over to Romans chapter 7 and verse 14. Paul said in Romans chapter 7, verse 14, we're not going to read this whole passage, but he says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Now, the Apostle Paul was probably the best Christian that ever lived. Yet Paul said, I am carnal, sold under sin. If you jump down to verse 24, he's been talking about how you know he tries to do good, but sin's always present with him. In verse 24, he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. It is very clear that the Apostle Paul was still a pretty sorry fella in the eyes of God. We would all be impressed with him. But do you understand that God was not impressed by, Saul, or by Paul's works? Now, he was pleased by his faith. That's what saved him. But listen, we've got a lot of people today, they're taking this lane. I call it the, you know, repent of your sin slash change life slash emotional experience lane, if you want to call it that. I know that's kind of a long title. I couldn't think of a shorter one. But there's a lot of people that they've lived, lived pretty wicked lives. They do a lot of bad things. And then they think, you know what? I need to turn from my sins in order to be saved. Well, here's the problem with that is... You know, you take the best person in this church. They still stink in the eyes of God. And for you to think that you can turn from your sins in a way that will get you to heaven. Once again, you don't understand just how bad your sin is. Now, listen, I know you might have been really bad at one time. You know, maybe you were a drunk and you were a drug addict and you stole, you know, you were a liar and you were a thief. And you ended up in jail. And then, you know, you, you quit doing all those things. Well, you know what? That's just common sense, folks. Listen, a life of crime does not pay. Okay? Prison is not worth it. All right? You know, being, you know, alcohol. There's no benefit to alcohol. You know, there's no benefit to drugs and, you know, living a life of crime. It's not worth it. You know why a lot of people quit doing those things? Because they grow up. Because they have common sense. And there's a lot of 12-step programs that can help you get over some of those things. But you understand that's not salvation. Because even if you quit doing a lot of those, and if you're a drunk and a drug addict and all that, quit doing that stuff, all right? Lord wants you to have a good life. Quit doing those things. But do you all understand that I'm still sinful today? That in the eyes of God, I'm still wicked today? That my righteousnesses are as filthy rags today? That's what I am today. I'm still a wretched man. If Paul was still a wretched man, surely I'm worse than he is. And yet, but people today, they're thinking the way to salvation is you've got to turn from your sins which, and you've got, to, you've got to quit doing these things. You've got to start going to church. You've got to get baptized. You've got to take communion. Do you really think that pleases God? You think that impresses God? Listen, if there was a way that we could achieve righteousness by the law, you know, then faith it would be of no effect. There would be no need for that. If we could turn from our sins, then why did Jesus Christ have to die on the cross? Well, listen, folks, we can't do that. We're not capable of doing that. Listen, we can have victory over some sin in our life, but we're going to fail. I've heard some of these people that say that, you know, they've gone, you know, days and weeks without sinning. And I'm thinking, man, well, you just killed your streak because you just lied. <laughs> you, you, you can't do that. And so for somebody to say, turning from your sins is salvation, well, my question is, do you think you're perfect now? And most people are smart enough to say no. So then what sins do you have to turn from? You know, and it's usually some man's standard of sin. Well, you know, I got a real big problem with drunks and drug addicts and murders and so those things. But, you know, there's other people, they might be more strict than I am. Maybe they've got a huge problem with people who don't go to church. 
and people who don't give their money or people who don't get baptized or whatever. And so they maybe do a higher standard. What's the standard? Listen, here's the standard, folks. If we're going to get to heaven, we have to be like Christ. No sin. 100% holy. We can't do that. Therefore, what do we have to do? We have to just say, Lord, I can't do it. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Come into my... Be, and be my savior. And the Bible says if we'll do that, he will save us from our sins. It's not about turning from your sin. It's not this false repentance idea that's out there. Repentance, it, it's a change of mind. You know, a lot of people, they are, they're thinking I'm, they're on that lane trying to work their way to heaven, trying to be good, trying to be better. You've got to repent of that. You know what you need to do? You need to realize I can't do that. I'm just going to trust Christ. I'm going to trust in his work to get me to heaven. That's what repentance really is. So that's that, that's that third lane. Uh, the next lane we see here is the lane of physical salvation. Now, this is one I have recently been running into a lot. I mean, I, I'm sure this attitude has been around for a long time. Well, I know it's been around because we see it in the Bible. But I have been hearing this so much lately that it's, it's starting to get aggravating. Okay, where I will ask someone... You know, have you ever have you ever been saved? You ever trusted Christ as your Savior? And then they want to tell me a story about when they prayed and God helped them survive cancer, or you know they uh, they were in a car accident and they flatlined and uh, God brought them back to life. All right, and listen, if God did that for you, great, that's wonderful. But y'all understand that's not soul salvation; that's just physical salvation. There's been many people that have received salvation from police officers or from firemen, but that's physical salvation. That's not soul salvation. Physical salvation, it's always only it's always temporary. Turn over to John chapter 4 and verse 13. Many people today too when they come to church, they're not looking for soul salvation, they are looking for physical salvation that was one of the biggest problems that they had in israel one of the reasons they didn't accept the messiah they were looking for physical salvation not soul salvation and in john chapter 4 verse 13 says jesus answered and said unto her whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again but whosoever drinketh of the water that i shall give him shall never thirst but the water that i shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. You all see that? Jesus was talking spiritually here, but at first she only heard the physical. What? Water? Where I won't have to draw water anymore? You know, that was a lot of work back then to have to walk out to the well on a hot day and drop that bucket down there and pull that water up. It's not like it is today. It was, it was hard work. And she's thinking, if I didn't have to come out here and draw water anymore, that would make my life so much easier. But Jesus said, you know what? That's not what I'm offering. What I'm offering, it's, it's spiritual. And thank God, she understood it. She got it. And she received the water of life, which is Jesus Christ. She received salvation. She never had to get it again. You only have to get saved one time, and it is forever. It never goes away. Thank God she got that. But at first... She was thinking physical help, physical salvation. And then also in John chapter 4, we're not going to read that whole story, but in John chapter, or uh, not John chapter 4, John chapter 6, verse 57, it says, As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Jesus talking about himself. I am the bread of life. If you eat me, you'll never hunger. He wasn't talking about physical hunger here. He was talking about spiritual hunger. Amen. He's talking about spiritual salvation. And the day before this happened was when he fed the 5,000 with those five loaves and two fish. And if you all remember... In that story, everybody was fed and was filled. Great story, right? Well, the next day they came back, they wanted more bread, didn't they? And Jesus didn't give them any bread the next day. He said, you know what? I'm the bread of life. You know what? You guys got the physical help yesterday. Now you need the spiritual help. I'm the bread of life. You need to eat me. And you know what? After they found out that it wasn't real physical bread, they left. They got out. They didn't get saved. And you know, a lot of people, they come to church 
They'll get involved in religion thinking this will make my life better. And I believe it will make your life better, but sometimes doing the things of God ends up meaning tribulation and persecution. And, you know, the devil, he's going to come after you when you get saved. Sometimes when people get saved, it means they're in for a rough road. But you all understand now they're on their way to heaven. But people do. They come thinking, no, I want physical salvation. I just want my life to be better. Well, folks, you know, it might, your life might get better. You know, your financial problems might all go away and your health problems might go away. But you know what? They might not. And even if they do, once again, even if the Lord gives you some kind of physical salvation, I've known people that have come to church because they had cancer. Now all of a sudden they're thinking about their soul. They've got, and then they got cured from cancer while they're in the church. And then you know what they do? Then they get out of church. They came for the physical salvation, not the spiritual salvation. And Jesus said, on that bread, not as the bread that your fathers did eat in the wilderness and are dead. I say this all the time. All those miracles that Jesus did in the New Testament, they were temporary, except for the spiritual ones. Lazarus, who was raised from the dead, he died again later. Everyone who Jesus ever raised from the dead died again later. All those sick people that Jesus healed got sick from something else later. The people that Jesus fed got hungry the next day. They were full the one day, but the next day they were hungry again. Those were physical things to prove he could do the spiritual things. And many people today, they have had an experience in the past where the Lord healed them of a sickness. The Lord, you know, helped them win a lottery or something. Or, they'll, you know, they'll, you know they'll, they'll give the Lord credit for all kinds of things. And they'll say, God did that for me, so I know I'm saved. But they have never received that free gift of salvation. Well, listen, was there ever a time... Where you asked him to save you from your sins. Where you realized that that gift of salvation, it was an eternal gift. One that you can't lose. Folks, if you think you can lose it, you don't understand what a free gift is. You don't understand eternal life. The Bible says when we're saved, we have eternal life. If it's eternal, it never ends. Well, if, we, if I have eternal life right now, and then I lose my salvation, then was what I had ever eternal life? Absolutely not. It doesn't even make sense to say that you could lose your salvation. But most people think, no, no, there's no way that person still saved. Look at what they did. I'm afraid you just revealed yourself. You're obviously trusting in your works. You're thinking, you know, well, fine. It's not a work that gets you saved, but it's a work that keeps me saved. And eh, wrong. No, it's the work of Christ. It's, it, he's one who keeps us saved. We are trusting in him. We are depending on him for salvation, nothing else. And, and many people today, they are missing out. And maybe they did. I, I talked to a lady the other day. I said, listen, maybe God gave you that physical salvation because he wanted you to get the spiritual salvation later. You know, God allowed you to live a longer life because you weren't saved yet. He wanted you to get saved spiritually. But you know what? It's like she couldn't even, it was like Jesus talking to the people in John chapter 6. They just weren't getting the spiritual message. And that's where many people are at today. They want to talk about a past experience in their life. You know, and sometimes it's like an emotional experience. Yeah, I went to church. I started speaking in tongues. The pastor blew in my face and I passed out. And, you know, they'll talk about things like that. Like that's proof that they're saved. No, that's not, that's not salvation, folks. That was an emotional experience. You know, women passed out when Elvis would sing. That didn't mean they were saved. That's just, that's ridiculous. That, and... That has nothing to do with salvation. And so that, but the, I'm telling you, many, many people, they're on that lane, and you know what? It's, it's going to lead them to hell. They've never accepted that free gift of salvation. And then, and then we have what I call the lane of no hope. The lane of no hope. And this, you know, this is where you could maybe put the false religions that are out there. There's a lot of religions out there that, teach all kinds of crazy things. We obviously don't have time to go through every type of religion, but listen, a massive majority of religions that are out there, it usually is some kind of works-based, be a good person teaching. I don't care if it's whether Catholicism, Hinduism, Buddhism, whatever, it's usually some kind of works-based salvation. 
And, uh, but then, you know, you do, you've got the, you've got the cults out there, you know, you've got the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses that have all kinds of crazy things. You've got your, uh, you know, there's all kinds of weird groups out there. Just, just flat out weirdos. You've got your atheists who clearly have no hope. Now there is no God right now. This is all there is. You've got humanists that, that teach that y'all you know, basically man is God. And listen, what these people don't realize, they have no hope. The Bible says, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. People often talk about the blessed hope as the rapture. But listen, the blessed hope, if you study that passage in Titus, it's talking about the fact that one of these days, we will be like Christ. And when does that happen? That happens at his appearing. When Jesus Christ appears, then we will be like him. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. One of these days, we will be like Christ. We have that blessed hope. But that blessed hope, that the hope that I have that I'm going to be like Christ, it has nothing to do with the fact that, you know what, I think I've got the determination, I think I've got the character, that I can make it happen myself. I think I can clean my act up good enough that one of these days people will look at me and they won't be able to tell the difference between me and Christ. No, that's not, that's not my hope. My hope is not in myself. No, my hope is in Jesus Christ, in his word. The Bible makes it very clear that one of these days he's going to come back. And when we see him, we will be like him. He will change us. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know how it all is going to work, but I believe he's going to do it. I will be like Christ one of these days. This group of people you see around here that say that some of them still look like pretty bad sinners. You know, just look at them. Listen, these people will be like Christ one of these days. These people that struggle with sin. Maybe some of you, you can't control your temper. Maybe some of you, you can't control your tongue. You can't control your bad habits that you have. One of these days, you're going to be like Christ. And it's, and it's going to be something that he does to us, not something we do to ourselves. In the meantime, while we're waiting, we do our best. Everyone that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. We're going to try to do what we can to clean our life up. We're going to do what we can to try to turn from our sins and be like Christ. But listen, I hope I never hear any of you say mission accomplished when it comes to that. That mission will not be accomplished until Jesus Christ returns and he will accomplish that mission, not you. And so in, in the end, you know, it really doesn't matter what lane you're in. Because they all end up in the same place, don't they? And, you know, the fundamental Baptist who has never gotten saved, they will go to the same hell that the Satanist goes to. Same one. It doesn't really matter. It's only one, it's, it's one road. It's a broad road. Many there be which go in there at. The broad road to hell, it is a well cared for, cared for road that I think IDOT would be proud of. You know, the devil, you know, he owns the road he owns all the billboards that are on that road. He's got some flashy billboards. He's got some tempting things. Hey, you know, just a few more miles and you're going to see this and you're, you're going to achieve this. You're going to have this pleasure in your life. He's got some tempting things on that road. He, those signs promise great destinations. Sometimes those signs, you know, they might tell you, hey, you know, you've got several years until you get to the end of your road. You know, he'll lie about how much time you have left. We don't know how much time we have left. You know, these billboards, these things that he's put up, they are, they are nothing but lies. He's got false prophets along those ways. If you, if you start thinking, you know what, I'm not sure about this and I want to stop and ask for directions. There are plenty of false prophets on his road that will tell you the wrong thing. I've had that happen before where people have given me wrong directions on purpose and made me end up places I, nobody would want to go to. And that, that's cruel. That's wrong. But listen, the devil, he's cruel. He's got those false prophets out there. And if you are on that road, if you can just get your eyes off the distractions of the devil, take your eyes off his billboards, stop listening to those false prophets, you will notice an exit on that road. And that exit, it's only marked with a cross. And that road, it's a humble road. It's, uh, it's not something that, it, it, and it's a narrow road. It's one that not many people are exiting on. Most people are going right past it, staying on that Broadway. But if you will take that road, that narrow road will lead you to heaven. It is the only way to heaven. And if you will repent in the true sense of the word 
and get off that road of good works or whatever lane that you're in, and you'll just trust in the work of Jesus Christ, you will be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I, I tell you, it, it breaks my heart how, when you think about how many churches that we have in this area. Churches all over the place. And yet a vast majority of the people that I talk to, they're on that broad way that's leading to hell. We've got to do what we can to start making a little more noise than the false prophets and start pointing people to that exit. Point them to the cross. Let them know that's the way to go. Let, you know, tell them that, that Broadway, it's a lie. Don't listen to those billboards. Don't listen to the, you know, the TV commercials and things that are out there. Don't listen to that stuff. Trust in the Word of God. Trust in Jesus Christ. And listen, don't get discouraged. It, we're, we're always going to be in the minority on this thing. But you know what? Let's pull whoever we can out of that. Let's pull whoever we can off that Broadway and into the narrow way. Thank God somebody did that for us. And so let's do that for whoever we can. So with that, let's all stand together.